and my name is Chris Willis. Um, I am the executive director of the special initiative on offshore wind, and I'll talk a little bit about about who we are and uh, and what and what we do. Um, but first, I wanted to go ahead and start sharing my screen and make sure that we're all set on the technical side of things. How does that look, Caitlin? Yep, looks good. You're all okay. set. Okay, great, great. So offshore wind in New Jersey and beyond. What we're going to cover today, uh, there's an overview slide up now. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the special initiative on offshore wind, uh, do some level setting on how offshore wind works, uh, You know, just kind of a little 101 for folks in case you haven't been following along on that. I know we have all different levels probably joining us today. I'll provide a global and national overview on what the offshore wind program is at a national and global level. Uh, dig down into the regional perspective uh, and then finally uh, directly to New Jersey and what things are happening in and around our state. We'll talk a little bit about the opportunities and challenges of offshore wind and uh, my favorite topic, which is uh, ocean user coexistence or compatibility of offshore wind with existing ocean uses. So that is our agenda for today. And again, starting off, just wanted to share with you about the special initiative on offshore wind. Uh, we are a uh, we're a policy think tank who relies on fact-based research and multi-sectoral collaborations and convenings. We provide expert analysis, information sharing, and strategic solutions to advance the responsible and sustainable development of offshore wind. Uh, we particularly work. Uh, for uh, usually for state and federal agencies who need policy guidance, technical expertise around these issues. We're guided by a steering committee of diverse interests. And to note, we are not a trade organization. We have uh, private foundation funding, which helps support our objectivity and the unique approach we have in the sector to our work around offshore wind. I uh, wanted to start out with a little bit about how offshore wind farms work. So on the slide now, uh, you can see a schematic that just gives a really basic layout of a typical offshore wind farm. And, you know, by no means is this at scale or, you know, representing, you know, necessarily a particular wind farm, but just to give you an idea of, of what a wind farm uh, would look like typically. Um, you know, kind of the star of the show are those offshore wind turbines. You'll see three of them depicted here on, on the image. Uh, those wind turbines are the elements of the project that are actually generating electricity as the wind blows and those blades are turning. Those three blade rotors are the most common uh, by far of the wind turbines in the, in the market of uh, those horizontal access turbines. Um, and we're, we, there, are, there are thousands of those turbines, and we'll talk a little bit about where they are in the world already installed in the oceans. Uh, those turbines are then secured to the bottom by a foundation by the sea, to the sea bottom. And uh, we'll talk about the different foundation types, whether fixed or floating, in a subsequent slide. From there, you can see the purple line that's outlined there uh, in the ocean, which represents the, uh, the, 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 the cables that run in between the turbines um, and then collect all that power and deliver it to an offshore substation. That offshore substation collects all the power together, does some amazing electrical magic that I can't say I know much about, but converts the power in a way that makes it suitable for uh, you know, long distance transmission. And then an export cable takes that power to shore. Now, depending on the size of the project, there may be more than one export cable, there may be more than one substation. So a lot of these, uh, you know, just like there may be and, and usually are more than three wind turbines, uh, there, you know, these are all these details are subject to change, but just to give you an idea of a schematic. The onshore substation then collects all that power together. And, you know, maybe you've seen these types of electrical infrastructure in your communities already. You've seen maybe a switch yard, or if you have those large overhead uh, transmission lines, you'll see a, an area where all of those power cables come 
together in a bit of a collector system. That is, uh, you know, kind of a typical either an open air or a housing that uh, is that onshore substation where all the power comes together. And then the power is circulated on the grid through the overhead transmission lines. Uh, typically, all the cables are buried until you get to that overhead transmission line portion of the project. And then it's delivered just like any other uh, electrical generation source using those, those overhead lines, those transmission lines. And the power is then delivered to homes and businesses in the region. As I mentioned, there are a few type of foundation types, and they are shown here on the slide kind of uh, moving left to right, that monopile foundation is the, the one that's used uh, most commonly around the world, that monopile foundation. And uh, you can think of it like a typical, like a bridge piling or a dock piling. Uh, they're typically uh, round structures that are piled, like a monopile there, piled into the seafloor. And it would really depend on the size of the turbine and the geotechnical conditions of the seafloor as to how deep that is buried or to uh, the size of that monopile. And each one is designed specifically for that location. There are also jacket or tripod foundations. They're typically used in slightly deeper water, but they are also fixed to the bottom. Those foundations uh, are used, and I'll talk a little bit about this, at our nation's first offshore wind farm, the Block Island Wind Farm. Those are jacket foundations, uh, but less typically used internationally. Um, and then further offshore, where the water is too deep to fix a monopile or a jacket, uh, there are uh, floating technologies being deployed. I don't know a lot about them, frankly, because they're typically used on other coasts than the Atlantic coast, where I have worked now for nearly two decades in offshore wind. We don't um, typically see much in the floating environment, but that is certainly something that is in the future and really is the future of offshore wind are these uh, floating structures. So you can take a look at some of those on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, I think it's important to note where the wind is uh, in the US and so kind of where many of the efforts are focused on developing offshore wind projects. Um, you can see on the map in front of you in the orange and red that uh, you know we certainly have very robust offshore wind resources in our region. Um, and what we're finding is that based on advancements in offshore wind and with the turbines themselves, we're able to capture even the lower spin wind speeds that are, for example, uh, off the coast of Louisiana that are pictured in green. So there's efforts afoot now uh, to try to understand and, and change the technology so that even the Gulf of Mexico can also uh, enjoy some of those offshore wind benefits. So the slide in front of you shows those uh, you know, purple, orange, and green uh, robust wind resources that we enjoy in the uh, the, the mid Atlantic and and the Northeast, and and really uh, the wind speeds are one important part of the equation. But another important part of the equation with respect to offshore wind is that uh, a large percentage of our nation's population are located near the coasts. Major cities have developed in coastal regions, and so this way we can develop power directly adjacent to where population centers are. And that's really a, a huge benefit to offshore wind for our region. And, and finally, another thing that's important is that uh, there really are not robust alternatives with respect to uh, clean energy options in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. We just don't have the space uh, or the resource in terms of wind or solar resources to be citing renewable energy on land. And so that is why uh, it's, it's very typical to see and, and why we saw offshore wind, I think, initiated in this region of the country. Because if you look at places like California, and maybe you've been there, you've seen large wind farms that are based on land. But uh, for those of us here who, who live in New Jersey know that there's not a, a large amount of space to put an on-land wind farm or onshore solar system. So offshore wind is a great alternative for our part of the country. 
I just wanted to step back and give you a bit of a, a global perspective on offshore wind. Uh, right now, we really see Europe and China leading the pack in terms of the installed amount of gigawatts. And on the slide on the left hand side, you can see uh, the the most um, the where where uh, most of the wind energy is located there in Europe. And you'll see, you know, it's typically Northern Europe, like the UK, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, they are the leaders in developing offshore wind. Uh, now, I think it's, let's see, 1991 was the operation of the first offshore wind farm. So let's see, what year are we in? That's 31 years ago now, since Europe started installing offshore wind farms. So we have a long way to go here in the US to catch up. Um, now they are over 25 gigawatts of offshore wind powering over 10 million, the equivalent of 10 million US homes. Uh, China has caught up quite quickly with over 26 gigawatts installed just over the past five years or so. So two maps showing where um, the, you know, the large extent of offshore wind has been developed over the past decades and now over 10,000 turbines installed in international waters around the world. We have a target here in the US to install 30 gigawatts by the year 2030. There's a map in front of you, it's kind of a little funny looking, uh, but it's essentially the two coasts cut out and kind of stuck together without the middle of the country. So you can see where the most offshore wind activity is happening. Currently operating, uh, we have two offshore wind farms that, uh, you know, I think the term wind farm may be a, a bit of a generous term. They are more like wind gardens, perhaps. Uh, small projects, the Block Island Wind Farm and the Coastal Virginia Project, constituting 42 megawatts uh, with a total of seven turbines only here in the US. Those turbines um, have been installed over the past five years or so and are really more demonstration style projects and uh, happy to take more questions about, you know, what the demonstrations are about and, and uh, you know, more details about those two projects. Really next up in the queue are two projects uh, in the Northeast, the Vineyard Wind One project, which is 800 megawatts. So, you know, that would be a substantial jump for us here in the US. And you can see on the map uh, that Vineyard Wind uh, lease area just off the coast of Massachusetts. And then the South Fork Wind Project of 132 megawatts that is located off the coast of uh, also, you know, not far from there off the coast of Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York. Um, so kind of doing the math, not that I'm really good at math. In fact, that's why I studied journalism when I went to Rutgers for an undergrad. Um, but uh, doing that math, we would still be under one gigawatt, even with these two other Vineyard Wind and South Fork Wind projects. Um, that we expect to, uh, you know, be operational in the next few years. So we have a long way to go to get to that 30 gigawatt target. It, they are, you know, these are really important targets in terms of meeting climate goals and uh, economic development goals, both at the state and national level. They are ambitious, but they are achievable. And so, uh, you know, there are quite a few different stakeholder groups and constituencies that are working hard to advance that 30 gigawatt by 2030 goal. Uh, so, you know, just uh, digging a little deeper and taking a closer in zoom to our region, you can see the lease areas um, on the Atlantic coast in the mid-Atlantic and Northeast. And uh, these uh, images are provided to us from the federal regulator who does let these areas off the coast of the United States. And we'll talk a little bit about that regulatory structure in just a moment and then all the way down to New Jersey. So these are the two lease areas you can see on your screen now that are let off the coast of New Jersey. The Northern lease area that you see in green was uh, that that one has been leased to a company called Atlantic Shores. And that is a joint venture by uh, Shell, Shell New Energy. So the clean energy division at Shell and uh, a French offshore wind developer called EDF. The southern lease area that's in brown has been leased to a company named Orsted. They are a Danish company who have been building offshore wind since the beginning. 
Denmark is famous for offshore wind, and they are the global leader in building uh, and, and operating offshore wind projects around the world. So two very capable developers uh, with those leases. Each of the lease areas now is uh, right now going through a, um, a permitting and uh, kind of an exploratory process in order to get all the permits and do all the site investigations in order to build the wind farms. Uh, those timelines are, you know, still a couple years out. There is, you know, quite a bit of uh, permitting and, and work yet to be done on those projects. But those are the, in fact, lease areas that are held by those respective companies. There was some very big news with respect to offshore wind a couple of weeks ago that perhaps maybe you saw. Um, so we just want to broaden the perspective out just a little bit more to the New York bite. Uh, the New York bite and the bite is a, an oceanographic term that designates an area, a body of water that uh, has, uh, has similar characteristics. And the New York bite runs from uh, Cape May, New Jersey, all the way out to the tip of Long Island and Montauk, New York. So that is what's known as the New York bite. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there were 4.3 Four billion. I don't even know how to say that. Four point three seven billion dollars invested in leases in the New York Bite area. Those uh, five lease areas are um, sorry. Those six lease areas are listed here on the slide. The corresponding bid amounts and their companies uh, are shown here on the slide. And you can see in the previous slide, I showed you that lease area off the coast of New Jersey. So that's on the far left hand side of the picture of those lease areas, that polygon, those are still those the, the lease areas held by Orsted and Atlantic Shores, but now these are the new lease areas, these six new lease areas that are in the what is called the New York Bite. And they they are very relevant to New Jersey. You know, I think we should call it the New Jersey Bite, right? Like let's let's go for reform on that. But uh anyhow, the long the long standing name of the New York Bite. Um, so these are the, those six areas. And um, these are a really great opportunity for New Jersey because as New Jersey develops this procurement schedule where offshore wind will be delivered to our state, there's now more real estate for the developers to tap into and to be delivering uh, that power to New Jersey. So this is, these are you know, growing and, and really exciting times in the offshore wind space. So we've been talking a lot about leasing I wanted to share with you a little bit more about who is leasing these areas anyway. Uh, this is uh, the Department of Interior's Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, also known as BOEM. So all the images that I showed you in the previous slides were provided by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. They have a very robust website, boem.gov, and you click on the Renewable Energy tab and you will just see a wealth of information about their process and what's going on. You can click on the New Jersey tab in their state activities and learn a lot more about what's happening in our state as well. But I just wanted to share with you a little bit about their process on getting to a, a leasing area and then through to construction and operations. Sorry, I'm talking a lot, I just drink some water. <clears throat> So, um, you know, typically this is a seven to nine year process. So for those leases that were just let, for example, in the New York bite, that would come at year zero if you're looking at this chart that is on the slide. So what starts with about a, a year or two of planning and analysis, and in the case of the New York bite, it was actually more like, I think, four or five years of planning and analysis where the state put forward ideas for potential lease areas. They met with uh, a wide variety of stakeholders to help refine and reduce the lease areas, in fact, to 75% uh, reduction in the original area that was originally proposed. Winnowed that down to the six lease areas that were let last just a couple of weeks ago, and the leases have been granted there. So taking that on a timeline, the next step for the developers would start to be, uh, you know, kind of doing some surveys out on their spaces, understanding the geological, the geotechnical, and the biological conditions on their sites. The developers then submit what's called a site assessment plan or a SAP. 
And that site assessment plan allows the developers to, to do site assessment activities on their site. After that, the developers will submit a construction and an operations plan or a COP, a COP, based on the information they learned during that site assessment period. That construction and operations plan is then submitted to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management for consideration. And BOEM has the opportunity to then approve that COP and then work through the uh, permitting process based on the materials that the developer has submitted about their project. So the New Jersey projects by Atlantic Shores and Orsted that are furthest along, right now they are in that construction and operations phase. So it doesn't mean that they're actually constructing anything. It more means that they are leading up to potential installation, which is the last part of our slide there on the red. So that construction and operations phase is really that opportunity uh, to go through uh, the different parts of the permitting process and, and move the construction and operation plan forward. Um, with respect to how I've looked at offshore wind and you know I've been doing this for quite some time now, I really see some discrete opportunities and challenges with respect to offshore wind. So I just wanna go through some of those with you now. Um, and then just to give you fair warning in about five to seven minutes or so, we're gonna open up the floor for questions. So I hope that uh, what you're hearing today and learning today is inspiring you and we can have a robust dialogue. Uh, the, the, with respect to the opportunities, certainly the economic development opportunities uh, for the state, region and nation are, are very uh, exciting and robust. The opportunity to create essentially a, a brand new sector here in the US that's associated with high paying uh, and, and responsible jobs that can be associated with clean energy development. They are career jobs. And it's everything from kind of your kind of typical office jobs like the one I have, um, all the way down to you know site management and facilities, turbine technicians, uh, site development. So there really is a wide variety. Uh, and, and exciting things that come from that are locating manufacturing facilities to, in association with those projects. And so in New Jersey, we actually have two really robust facilities located on the Delaware River. One is at the Port of Paulsboro, and one is located at Lower Alloways Creek, both on the Delaware River on, on the New Jersey side. So both of those projects are happening in tandem, and that is just a really exciting economic development opportunity for the entire, that kind of South Jersey area. The environmental benefits of offshore wind are very clear with respect to being able to take uh, all those uh, fossil generating plants offline. And certainly we are currently seeing the geopolitical implications of the challenges with respect to fossil fuels and, and uh, those imports. Having the opportunity to be, uh, you know, have that true energy independence with a clean energy source like those that come from wind and solar are, are available to us here in the United States and provide the opportunity to clean the air, to mitigate impacts of climate change, and really you know, provide the, you know, on, on a, a net benefits test, really on balance, the cleanest energy opportunity we have for us. Um, and in addition, really a reliable energy supply. You, perhaps you've seen the headlines and you've seen the movement with respect to electrification of not only uh, you know, buildings and vehicles, but in addition, we are, you know, exponentially plugging in more things than we ever have as a society. So this, you know, kind of surge towards electrification is really exciting. However, if we electrify everything with fossil fuel, fossil fuel based energies, then we're really not doing any better by the environment. So having clean sources, reliable sources of electricity, uh, you know, maybe if you're in the South Jersey region, you're familiar with some of the power plants that have come offline, like the BL England plant, like Oyster Creek nuclear facility. We really need to have reliable energy sources and offshore wind is kind of, kind of ready to go, as I mentioned, uh, 30 years in the making here in the U.S. There are, of course, significant challenges in developing offshore wind. Uh, one that comes to mind pretty quickly is the interconnection challenge. Uh, you know, if you think about the way 
the grid has operated and the way the grid has essentially been structured is that power to New Jersey specifically has been generated in the West and it flows to the East. So typically we have the large generators and then the longer, you know, those bigger transmission towers. And then those finally, those little capillaries that make their way all the way out to the coastlines. Well, we are presenting here kind of a fundamentally different approach to delivering energy, generating power in the East and delivering it to the West, which kind of turns the model on its, on its head. And so there needs to be kind of substantial upgrades to those coastal, uh, those coastal injection points. And uh, there is strong consideration in New Jersey for a shared transmission system, which is an exciting thing actually that I you know, spent quite a few years of my career working on. But this idea that we could locate uh, a backbone system or a power strip, if you were, out in the ocean environment, and then the offshore wind farms could each plug into that power strip with just you know a few of those cables coming to shore themselves, we still need to though harden those uh, kind of those injection points at the coastal areas, and many of the states in the Atlantic region are exploring ways to you know develop those upgrades and accept that injection of clean energy from east to west. We have some supply chain constraints meaning that we do not have a well-developed supply chain for offshore wind in the United States yet. That's not particularly surprising because we only have seven wind turbines where, you know, Europe and China have many thousands. And so you'll, you know, typically see most manufacturing located more close to the actual, uh, you know, site of those large offshore wind farms. We are already seeing now, though, commitments for those uh, manufacturing facilities to move here to the U.S., but it's a little bit of a chicken of an egg an egg thing because you know for example uh, you know Siemens who you know Siemens Gamesa who makes some of the turbines they're hesitant to locate uh, you know spend tens of millions of dollars to build a manufacturing facility until they can be sure that there is a pipeline for uh, for their wind turbines uh, but you know I think as we've seen demonstrated particularly with the New York bite auction a couple of weeks ago there is very serious interest in the industry and hopefully uh, you know a relatively streamlined and smooth path forward for permitting and the regulatory environment uh, the last thing that I would just mention is something that's near and dear to my heart are the complex stakeholder issues that are presented uh, and that's kind of across the suite of existing ocean users. And you know that's everyone from commercial and recreational fishing to uh, navigation and shipping to non-consumptive ocean uses, tribal representatives, uh, you know, of course the actual resources that swim in our live in our oceans and use it and depend on it. So it's really a balancing act of you know working with coastal communities, coastal landowners, um, and all of these existing stakeholders to design projects that work for, for those local environments to help supply this clean energy to the nation. I, I will just brag for a moment and share that uh, the special initiative did release uh, our supply chain contracting forecast just at the end of last year, which describes how there is a $109 billion revenue opportunity for this supply chain development over the course of the next get decade to get to 30 gigawatts. And what's really exciting to me is this $109 billion revenue opportunity is all private sector spending. That, uh, you know, those estimates and our modeling show that, you know, that is what's needed for the private sector to invest. So there is, you know, then opportunities beyond that for, you know, kind of state and federal match. And, and you know other opportunities there. But this is one of the largest uh, private sector investments in, uh, in our nation uh, and really re represents a strong opportunity. The falling cost of offshore wind really is uh, what is driving a lot of this opportunity. So you can see that trend line uh, showing that um, the, the cost of offshore wind falling precipitously since you know over the past 10 years or so with the red stars on the chart showing the cost of offshore wind uh, for the U.S. projects here in the United States. 
So, you know, that also is really exciting because, you know, I think it's, um, you know, a common misconception that offshore wind energy or clean energy is expensive. What we really see is that what is expensive is, uh, you know, having to deal with the associated uh, consequences of fossil fuel development, whether that's geopolitical, environmental, or otherwise. Um, some of the reasons that costs are, are dropping, and we've seen over a 60% drop in Europe over the past five years, is uh, you know, technology development, including larger wind turbines. The larger the wind turbines are, the fewer need to be installed offshore. And uh, you know, there is a significant capital cost in built, like really the biggest cost of an offshore wind farm are the capital expenditures. So to the extent that we can reduce the number of turbines that are needed to be installed offshore, then you can really reduce the cost, the capital expenditures cost. So that's helping bring down the project cost overall. Uh, in addition, there's much more experience in the supply chain, which helps bring offshore wind uh, you know, to countries in uh, a much more efficient and economic way. And as I mentioned before, this project pipeline here in the US is uh, assuring the payoff of those supply chain investments from those, uh, from those tier one suppliers. Um, you know, thought I would just share a slide. Um, this is also from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Just kind of depict, actually, I think this is from the National Renewable Energy Lab. That part of my slide is kind of covered up by my name. But um, anyhow, that's uh, by the National Renewable Energy Lab, which shows some of the projections of how, you know, offshore wind, uh, the size of the turbines is growing. The turbines that are predicted to be used off the coast of New Jersey are 12 to 15 megawatts in size. But, uh, you know, it shouldn't be long until, you know, 17 megawatts, 20 megawatt turbines are available. And uh, what one interesting fact is that the components, uh, many of the components, especially the rotor blades, are so long that they can't be transported over our nation's roadways, which really just creates more opportunities for the ports. So you'll see a real focus on port development, what's called marshalling or staging, because if uh, a wind turbine was to be manufactured in the interior portion of our country, there would be no way to get it to the coast except by vessels offshore. So that's one thing that limits the capacity of onshore wind is that there's no way to move many of these larger components and uh, I'm not an engineer, but uh, the larger the components, there is a formula that dictates how much more energy can be generated uh, when you have uh, the larger rotor uh, blades and such. So I think I just have a couple more slides to go through. Was this just two? Okay, I had a little delay there. Um, so I mentioned about you know the uh, the stakeholders that are involved with offshore wind. This is again kind of my favorite topic, but I've listed out here on the slide really the the wide swath of folks. And I, I like to tell my mother when she asks about offshore wind, I tell her, "Mom, you're a stakeholder. You know, you go to the beach every year. We were you know spent most of our time at Seaside Park in Manasquan growing up." in the summers and, you know, it was really, uh, you know, I think as a beachgoer, we are important stakeholders uh, in, 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 in offshore wind, but listed here on the slide, many who are engaged and involved with respect to offshore wind. And I think by virtue of you being here today, hopefully demonstrates that you are a stakeholder and an interested party and uh, just delighted to know that you're out there and that you're, uh, you know, interested in learning more. The most prominent stakeholder concerns that we typically hear in the offshore wind sector are around viewshed, so concerns about seeing the uh, turbines from shore and what implications that has for local communities, impacts to the local landfall locations, and you know because essentially we talked about those submarine cables coming to shore, so what impacts those may have at local landfalls, impacts to existing ocean users, uh, fishing communities, shipping and navigation, et cetera. Potential environmental issues, the impact to marine mammals during construction, uh, environmental justice angles, and certainly we can't forget about the birds that are out there and very important to consider. And um, cost issues, which 
are largely allayed uh, by you know these a lot of the cost falling that we discussed. I would say ten years ago that was a bigger concern for many stakeholders, but now we're seeing uh, really competitive, competitively priced power when you compare that to conventional resources. Stakeholders certainly do have a very powerful impact on offshore wind. The uh, first three projects that you see listed here on this slide never made it to fruition. So the Long Island project, Blue Waters project in Delaware and Cape Wind never made it to fruition. And that was largely two stakeholder concerns around the project. In fact, the Block Island wind farm was delayed over a year because there was strong objection to where the cable was making landfall. So it took the developer some time to figure out the best place to make landfall working with the community. And that worked out well. And now that Block Island wind farm is operating in a very successful project for Block Island itself. On the slide now is my contact information. That is my cell phone number. So please take a screenshot, jot it down. Caitlin knows how to get in touch with me always. And also there's my email address. Always happy to take any questions or comments now or later. And I think now we're gonna just open the floor so that we can hopefully have a conversation. All right, great. Thanks so much, Chris. That's a lot of great information. Um, and we do have some questions uh, in the chat. I'm gonna scroll up here a little bit. Some are bright to me and then some are for everybody. Um, so the first question, uh, are the proposed facilities at the Paulsboro and Lower Alloways a fact or are they just proposed locations for now? <clears throat> they are, um, the, the Paulsboro facility is under construction, which is really exciting. Uh, you, so you can actually go see that. That is a, a facility that's being built by a company called EEW. They are a German manufacturer who are now locating a plant here in the United States. They'll be hiring uh, hundreds of workers at their facility. And what they're going to be doing there at the Port of Paulsboro is rolling the steel tubes that become that monopile that hold the turbine up. So, you know, we talked about the monopile foundation. Well, on top of the foundation, there's the tube that leads up to the rotors. They are going to be rolling those huge steel um, columns and uh, then shipping them out to the site for the offshore wind farm. What's exciting is that New Jersey, and you saw on these maps, is really at the center geographically of the activity. So those, uh, those wind farms, not just New Jersey's, but really across the um, really across the region can be serviced from that port of Paulsboro. The lower Alloways Creek site, that is called the New Jersey Wind Port. That is the development of that project is being led by the state of New Jersey. And right now they are in uh, the permitting phase of that project. So that is a proposed facility not yet under construction, but has been made significant progress. Okay, great. And then I think the next question, you may have answered this just a few minutes ago, but who is building the Paulsboro facility? Is that that EEW? Correct. Okay. Um, the next question is, where are the blades manufactured if we can't build them internally in the U.S.? Uh, parentheses, you may have answered this already. I said this for a minute. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, well, so it depends on um, who the developer is contracting. Um, and I can't remember, I don't want to misquote, but right now they're all being made in Europe. Um, but I think, I think France is, develop, is, is building the turbines for Orsted through GE. Um, but don't quote me on that. I think the developers have that on their website. But the short story is they're all being made in Europe now. And they're all going to be floated over here, which is kind of ridiculous. That's why we want to locate manufacturing in the United States, because it's not economical or reasonable to be floating these things across the ocean all the time. But the, develop, the, the manufacturers just want to see the pipeline uh, solidified before they build the big facilities here. Right. Makes sense. They're taking yeah. a big chance right now to, to build a big facility right now. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, last summer, we saw a lot of public outcry against the wind farms from people on LBI who may be able to see the turbines from shore at this late stage of the game. Can this really have an impact on the planning? 
Well, let me take a step back and, and you know, maybe, uh, you know, kind of challenge that question a little bit. We really see kind of overall strong support for offshore wind. There is a vocal minority that objects to offshore wind for sure. They are, you know, on LBI. They, you know, certainly are becoming much more well organized. They've, in fact, filed a lawsuit against the federal regulators. Uh, they certainly could have an impact on the siting of the wind farms. There is still a lot to do. There is still the entire spectrum of the permitting process that needs to be gone through. All of those permitting processes have public comment opportunities, alternatives analysis. There's something called the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA that needs to be complied with any time a federal agency is, is, you know, has a, what's called a major federal action. So granting a, a permit to build a wind farm would be constitute would constitute a major federal action. So in complying with NEPA, you will see many comment periods coming up. Maybe you've seen other infrastructure projects built, and there's an opportunity to do uh, to provide these comments. Mm -hmm. The yeah. agencies want to hear, you know, so like with Vineyard Wind, for example, that next 800 megawatt project that's in construction. You know, there was something like 15,000 public comments that came in, but it was, you know, 14,000 public comments that supported the project and a thousand that didn't. And so the regulators try to bring together all that information and deliver the best project for the majority of our country. Gotcha. Okay, good to know. Um, Someone also just said great information. Um, next question was, uh, what happens at the end of the life of this project? Do you remove the installation? You do. Yeah, they're they're fully decommissioned. Um, okay. And that what the developers do now is they put money in a bond that is held by the federal government to account for that decommissioning. You know, for example, if the project is sold to another developer or the developer, you know, is insolvent for, for whatever reason, the money is set aside. And the plans are are uh, set up now so that at the end of the lifespan of the wind farm, which is typically 25 to 30 years, that project could either be repowered with different turbines on top, or it would be removed altogether. Okay. Um, next question, or actually it might be a comment. Um, I read an article that the power may not come ashore in New Jersey. Connecticut is making a bid to be the location for bringing the power ashore and getting it on the grid. Seems unfair that the turbines will go offshore or off the New Jersey coast and New Jersey might not get the power plant and jobs that go with it. I understand Oyster Creek is a perfect place for that. Um, so yeah, um, what do you think? Yeah, not true. Um, they're uh, okay. both, all the, the New Jersey projects will all deliver power into the PJM grid here in New Jersey. Pretty uh, clear plans are laid out with each of the developers on where they would make landfall with their respective projects. All of the states on the Atlantic coast, except for Delaware, do have procurements to bring power. So Connecticut will have power delivered, but that's from a project called Sunrise Wind, which is a different project altogether in okay. the Northeast. So maybe there's so many projects out there, it's really hard to keep track. So I know it's like you read a headline, you think, oh, how does this impact New Jersey? That's when you just text me and be like, hey, Chris, <laughs> I heard about this project, you know, like help me understand. So yeah, those two projects will make landfall. And it's ironic because some people don't want the cables to come to New Jersey. So mm -hmm. the cable making landfall in New Jersey doesn't really change the economic development opportunities for the state, you know, okay. because just, that's just trenching a cable and, you know, bringing it to shore, so. Okay, and they said, thanks for clearing that up, yeah. yeah. Um, I actually had a question about how would uh, this could impact, you know, you see a lot of people around New Jersey, a lot, a lot of people have solar panels or right. are thinking of considering solar panels. So I was thinking, um, would that, you know, um, impact demand for solar or in, in, in any other way uh, for those alternative uh, industries or companies? That are also providing alternative energies. Is there? Do you predict any changes for that? I mean, I know people are probably going to get a you know electric bill in their mailbox either way. <laughs> it just depends yeah. on where it's coming from. Um, yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I mean, I really think, and you know, it's just kind of my opinion here. But there, uh, what what we're trying to do is create uh, you know systems that can store electricity. 
um, with batteries and such. And so, you know, what, what we need to do, because both solar and wind are both variable sources of electricity. When there's no sun, there's no solar power. When there's no wind, there's no wind power. Mm -hmm. And so being able to feed the grid and feed our homes and businesses with clean energy, we're going to need to be able to store energy in batteries and other things that, or with hydrogen uh, that, you know, are not fully developed yet. I think we really need an all of the above strategy. I the solar the 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 solar markets. If you think about it, Caitlin, um, when you build an offshore wind farm, it's a it's a commercial. It's like an industrial plant. It's like building BL England or building Oyster Creek. When you put a solar panel at your house, that's what's called distributed generation. So that's no longer commercial. So it's a kind of a completely different market. And so then that distributed generation would supply power locally to you. Um, and then would be supplemented by that commercial or industrial generation, just like, you know, when the sun wasn't shining, you would get power from another commercial wind plant, a sure. commercial power plant. Yeah. So that's how, whether it was natural gas or whatever it would be. Gotcha. Okay. Right. So I, like right now, New Jersey is doing some tremendous things, the Board of Public Utilities to help stimulate the solar market. So I think you're just going to see a lot more of that going on. Okay. Interesting. Uh, a few more questions. Uh, will we see an increase in our electric bill before we see a decrease? Well, what's very interesting is that um, what I would like to model is <laughs> right now our dependence on fossil fuels is strong. And so what impact the geopolitical conditions are will have in increasing our electric bills because Original models showed that each rate payer in the state of New Jersey would pay $1.46 per household per month for Ocean Wind One. Okay, $1.46 per month. But that was based on numbers from five years ago, four years ago now. And so what's happening is we're starting to see, because of the volatility in the markets, uh, we're going to start to see our energy bills go up. And now we will have a fuel a fuel alternative in offshore wind that is stably priced and you know will likely be under market pretty soon. So right. um, energy markets are really complicated is the short way to say it. Right now it's anticipated that $1.46 for Ocean Wind One. Uh, other models I have not yet seen, but I, you know, really in terms of like the margin of error. Offshore wind is competitive with con conventional energy sources or lower, as we've seen in other states north of us. So, okay, uh, you know, typically I see much more than a dollar and forty six cents fluctuation in my electricity bill myself. I don't know about mm -hmm. you guys. So, it's 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 it's, it, it's kind of within the margin of error at this point. Okay, uh, a couple more. Uh, what is being done to mitigate impacts to wildlife migratory patterns? Yeah, great question, and and so much work. Uh, really, there are um, nonprofits being stood up to designate kind of regional strategies on this. There is a uh, a locally a locally developers need to figure out site specific solutions. Uh, there are state mandates that require solutions. So uh, let me just get a little more specific than that and say, um, you know, really the two biggest concerns with respect to the environment right now are migration of marine mammals and migration of avian species. So the questioner didn't distinguish, but I'll just talk about both. Um, with respect to migration of marine mammals in New Jersey is a very popular migratory corridor. There's a few things we can do. One is we can figure out, and we, we have these data to understand when marine mammals are not migrating. We focus construction of the wind farms when there is not that migratory window. The good thing is the construction season for offshore wind is best in the summer. And by then, most of the marine mammals have migrated north of us where they want to be in cooler waters in New England. So that kind of works well for New Jersey. Secondly, what we can do is always make sure that there are these federally mandated and trained protected species observers, PSOs, that are on all the construction vessels. These, these PSOs uh, have special training and they are scoping out and making sure that there are no marine mammals within a certain area of around where the pile driving is happening to make sure it doesn't impact their hearing. 
A third thing we can do is what's called a soft start or a ramp up. So once the pile driving starts for these marine mammals, in case there are any in the area, you start with a light hit to the bottom. Then you ramp up the acoustic activity over a certain period. And essentially this would just scare an animal out of the area as opposed to actually harming them, which we certainly want to avoid. And then finally, we would use a suite of what's called PAM or passive acoustic monitoring. You set up a PAM suite of, uh, these are collect acoustic collectors around the project area. And this way you can hear of any of the, uh, the marine mammals that are vocalizing and avoid those areas or wait till they are out of the area. So we can use acoustic sensors and visual sensors to ensure that there are no marine mammals in the area. And then finally, 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 there are physical technologies like bubble curtains, which, you know, you open your package from Amazon and they have those fun squeezy things that are like you little pop those bubbles. You take an enormous version of one of those that has a mile size circumference and you drape it all the way around the construction site and it helps hold in noise as a noise mitigation tool. So that's called a bubble curtain technology and that's been designed by offshore wind developers over the past years to help contain noise. Wow. With respect to avian migration, one thing that's super important is siting. Site the wind farm outside of the migratory corridor to start with, and then you don't have the potential for the impact. What we've heard from New Jersey Audubon is support for any project that's located more than eight miles off the coast of New Jersey. The closest wind farm we have is 15 miles. So New Jersey Audubon has, and you can see op-eds that have been issued saying, hey, we're worried about climate change. We're worried about the habitat loss for avian species because of climate. And if we don't clean our energy system, that's really the most important thing. So keeping those wind farms more than eight miles from shore, and then of course, keeping up with all the monitoring and modeling that's involved with the avian, uh, the avian risk assessment, which is required by state and federal agencies. So that was like 3000 pages in three minutes. So, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. A lot of lots going on. And actually, yeah. um, uh, I just wanted to also say that the Jacques Cousteau Reserve, um, uh, about a month ago, we had an eco evening presentation um, from Dr. Josh Kohut from oh, nice. University. And he has his uh, underwater robot gliders that are. Uh, deployed for these specific reasons as well to maintain or to monitor um, marine mammals where they're going in as part of that project or that effort to you know track where they're going um, and where they are um, off the coast. So actually I'm going to put if you're interested in watching that video and how robots um, are helping to inform you know location of offshore wind turbines, um, I have that in the chat for you guys as well. Um, so I think we're, we're really close to time. Um, someone, I, oh, there's another question about Gardner, uh, Gardner's Basin and AC as, as an example of a smaller port involvement in the construction and maintenance process as I guess an example of, right. um, yeah. Oh, I guess that, that they were asking that as a question. Oh, or, I'm sorry. Is it an example? Yes, yes. it is absolutely an example of okay. the, um, the Orsted is, is building um, an operation and maintenance facility there. So that's exciting. It's been a disused and um, a contaminated site in the Gardner's Basin of Atlantic City for many years. It was abandoned by ExxonMobil and has been leaching chemicals and Orsted mm -hmm. is going there and cleaning it up and building a beautiful new facility where the vessels will go you know, in and out and, you know, provide operations and maintenance, providing jobs uh, for the folks in and around Atlantic City and uh, really, you know, kind of rehabbing an old sad site. So yeah. that's a, a great story. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's that's good to hear. Um, and then uh, someone was wondering if we can get a copy of the slides. Sure. Happy to okay. send those to you, Caitlin. Yeah. 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 And I can email it out to everybody that attended today. And then final question uh, before we uh, wrap things up, uh, is the developer also required to monitor marine mammals during site assessment surveying of the seafloor? Yes, depending on the equipment they use. So they usually get you know, permits based on the level of noise that they're emitting with whatever instrumentation they need to use. 
It's called Incidental Harassment Authorization from the National Marine Fisheries Service. And that IHA, as it's known, will have certain mitigation requirements uh, from the federal regulators. Okay. Um, all right. So, oh, I did have one more if you have time for one more. Uh, sure. Okay. Yes, I do have a, another 130, but happy, happy to take one more. Oh, okay. Uh, quick uh, then questions about turbines during a hurricane or storm. I've often thought about this myself. Yeah, well, so the turbines themselves are rated for a hurricane, uh, a category four hurricane, which, you know, we typically don't see here in New Jersey. Fortunately, what happens is uh, after there's a um, 55 mile an hour winds or so, depending on the turbine itself, between 55 and 60 miles an hour, uh, the blades do something really cool. So essentially, if you would imagine that when a face of a, a turbine, you, you know, you want to have the wind hitting it so that you have the maximum rotational opportunity. But what happens is at 55 or so mile an hour plus, the wind turbine turns itself so that the wind blows past it and a brake is applied so that the rotors don't continue to, to spin anymore. And so the winds blow right past it. We actually had a front row seat to the ACUA in Atlantic City. They have a, a webcam. Mm. And uh, during Superstorm Sandy, it was the most viewed webcam in the state because people <laughs> wanted to see what would happen. And those, frankly, older model turbines uh, fared very well. Oh, so yeah. um, they've survived storms in the North Sea for 30 years. So there's, there's engineering opportunity there, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. And, uh, well, I think that's it for our questions. And, um, I would just want to say, Chris, thank you so, so much for all of that information. Um, great to hear about what's going on. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll continue to keep everyone posted as, as the progress continues or as, things, uh, you know, um, move forward. Um, and uh, I just want to give you a, a virtual round of applause for all of the great information that you shared. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you again for uh, coming out and talking to all of us about this. Um, so I, I think that's it for today. I also put in the chat um, the information about our upcoming programs, my email. Um, I'll email you all Chris's slides if you're interested as well. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and uh, thank you again. I'll uh, let everybody go and enjoy the rest of your day today. Thanks, Caitlin. Have a great yeah. day, everyone. Bye, Chris. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody.